Hello, and welcome to today's lecture on the Gracchi, Rise of the Populares. I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we are going to see what's going on in the city of Rome after Rome has expanded across most of the Mediterranean. So we're going to go ahead and start by setting the scene. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the effects of imperialism. We'll move into the life of Tiberius Gracchus, Tribune in 133 BC, and then his younger and even more powerful brother uh, Gaius Gracchus 10 years later. And then we'll wrap it up with a few concluding thoughts. So how did we get here? Remember, it starts almost a millennium earlier in the early, early Iron Age, uh, where tribes, the diversity of tribes, encompassed the entire Italian peninsula, the most powerful of which were the Etruscans. And they were much more powerful than the city of Rome when it was founded in 753 BC by Romulus. And for 250 years, a series of seven kings ruled the city. And while they started out really good, they ended in a not so good kind of way. And we move into the Roman Republic where we get Lucius Junius Brutus and Lucius Tarquinius Colatinus overthrowing Tarquin the Proud and instituting uh, this new form of government where there will never be a single king and where two people always must hold the highest office of consul, shared power, and we also get power dispersed to the people who can now vote on people to represent them. Now, uh, what we end up seeing is the very quick expansion of Rome starting in the, the, the third century BC. So over the first 500 years of the city, Rome expands fairly slowly. It kind of takes them 250 years just to kind of expand outside the city walls, and then another 250 years to take dominion over the Italian peninsula. But after that, over the next century plus, we see Rome expand uh, kind of not just to the islands here, but across most of the Mediterranean, including Spain and North Africa, Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica, Greece and Macedonia, and even to the, what they call the province of Asia in modern day Turkey. So what are the effects of this imperialism? One of the things they do is they pick up a different style of agriculture. So over the first few centuries right, of the Roman world, they have these small citizen farmers. So if you were kind of a normal family, you would have your own small farm, uh, you'd produce enough food for your family, and then you'd have a little extra that you could go and sell. But after being embroiled with these wars with Carthage, what Rome ends up doing is picking up the Carthaginian style of agriculture. And that's based on what the, the Romans call latifundia. And you can think of these kind of like a plantation. So it's a huge estate, kind of a massive uh, agricultural kind of complex that you see here, and then a big hinterland where the agriculture and where the um, kind of crops would actually be grown. Now what's happening is during this time as Rome expands, there's an incredible influx of slave labor because Rome keeps winning all these battles, moving populations around and selling people into slavery. And so what's able to happen is these latifundia grow bigger and bigger and bigger, and they're staffed by the slaves that are coming in from their conquests of war. And what that means is kind of just like in business today is something like Walmart or Amazon grows bigger and bigger and bigger. The little guy just can't compete. And so the smaller farms sell their land to the bigger farms, and then those smaller farmers need to go somewhere. And where are they going? They're going into the cities, of course. So the city of Rome at this period of time is growing in terms of population exponentially. It's going very, very quickly. And it's because all these smaller farmers come in and they've got to figure out something new to do, right? So they open up a shop and provide a service or they sell something. Um, and so Rome is really becoming a metropolis in this period of time. And we can see that in the actual kind of archeological record. If you go to a site like Pompeii, uh, we can see all these new services that wouldn't necessarily have been around a few hundred years earlier. So this is what like a normal kind of tavern in Pompeii looks like, right? We call this a thermopolium, a place where you can go get hot food. And you can see kind of the places where they'd have the snacks and wine set up. You could see um, where they'd have these kind of bowls of food or wine down here. And uh, you could basically, just like today, pull up to the bar and get yourself some food and drink. Now, in terms of the kind of socioeconomic hierarchy, things are changing here as well. So we'll remember way back, kind of going back to the early Republic, there was a big split between the patricians, the kind of rich family, the patres that go back to the, the origins of the city, and the plebeians, the regular people. And remember, the plebeians would like, during warfare, they'd basically leave battle, go up onto the sacred mountain, and say, hey, we're not fighting until you give us equal rights. 
Well, the thing is that over the course of several hundred years, the plebeians basically won. They got all the rights they were looking for. And so what ends up happening during the second century is that the division between patrician and plebeian isn't as important. Instead, we get a new series of divisions, okay? So even though that one disappears, Roman society becomes more complex than ever. So we've got all these new slaves. Many times they're free, they're freed, right, after their period of service. Uh, we've got free laborers, merchants and soldiers and artisans, aristocrats and magistrates, the equestrian kind of cavalry class, right, of a certain amount of wealth, and then the senators at the very, very top. And the big division that arises here no longer is called patrician and plebeian, but rather it's the optimates, right? So we don't call it the optimates, it's the optimates in Latin. And those are the best people, very literally. Really, they're the richest people. And they go against the populares, right? The populares are the people's people, right? The regular people. And so even though we don't have patrician and plebeian anymore, we essentially get the same kind of struggle just with new names, the optimates versus the populares. Politics is also getting extremely competitive at this time because Rome is getting richer and richer, there are more people involved, but it's the same number of small offices right at the top. Now, what Romans are trying to do, they're trying to climb this political ladder that we call the cursus honorum, right? The route of honors. And it's a four-step process from Quaestor, who's in charge of financial affairs, to Aedile, uh, who puts on public games and takes uh, care of public buildings, to Praetor, you might think of them as like a vice president, they're the second in command, and then the consul is the highest office. Um, and then after you have either a praetorship or a consulship, you can go out and govern the provinces. So that's the kind of way it works. And what people have seen is that you can get incredibly rich doing a couple different things. You can get incredibly rich by fighting large battles against some of these other empires, right? So Scipio, Af Scipio Africanus is a great example. And you can also get very rich by governing provinces because you get to collect taxes there and things like that. And you have a lot of incentive to kind of extort the population. So politics is becoming very, very competitive so people can get these kind of prime positions fighting other empires and ruling the provinces. And we can see how powerful individuals can get by looking at somebody like Scipio Africanus, right? So he's starting to get these kind of um, privileges that he doesn't necessarily deserve based on the rules. So he's able to become a proconsul and head out to the provinces, even though he was never a regular consul. And then when he's done that, he kind of comes back and eventually is elected as the regular consul, but he's able to do that before he's made it to the position of praetor. And so we're able to kind of see people start to break the rules once they get enough popularity and enough power that they can kind of make the rules up as they go. And we're going to see that this actually causes some serious problems. Now, as Rome expands, culturally what's going on is they're becoming more and more embroiled in the Hellenistic world, right? In this kind of Greek world, the successor kingdoms of Alexander the Great. And we'll see in that part of the world, even though Rome comes to rule, they adopt kind of Greek as the main language, the kind of common language of the aristocratic people and of the administration out there. Um, we end up seeing that Rome adopts kind of some Greek styles in architecture, both in their homes and in their kind of temples. And we'll see that Rome adopts uh, a little bit of kind of um, envy about Greek art and literature and philosophy, and they try to adopt uh, and um, copy, more or less, these kind of Greek styles in their own art and literature and philosophy. And we could call this something like the great cultural synthesis of Rome and Latin culture coming eastward and meeting those successor kingdoms and really adopting a lot um, of Greek culture from that area. So now we're going to move and we're going to talk about um, this guy Tiberius Gracchus, who's one of the first individuals to kind of realize how much power lies in the people. Now in 133 BC, right, with Rome at the peak of its power, expanding all across the Mediterranean, there are issues. So one of the things that we had just talked about, right, is that people are getting displaced from the land. People are moving into the cities. And this is a problem, not just for some of those people who get displaced and have to move, it's actually a problem for the Roman state as well. And the reason for that is that in order to join the Roman army, 
you had a land requirement. So you had to own a piece of land in order to be part of the Roman army. Now, as people lose their land and move to the cities, you ba they basically don't have that, that requirement anymore. So one of the things that Tiberius Gracchus does is he's elected to the rank of tribune. And if you remember this, this is kind of one of the, the most powerful offices of the plebeians, okay? And so this is uh, normally an office for the kind of poor segment of society, but it has a couple things, right? You can veto uh, anything that the, uh, the patricians or the, the other uh, magistrates put it forth, and you are also sacrosanct. Nobody can touch you while you're in office. And in this office, Tiberius Gracchus puts forth a piece of legislation that basically would take large chunks of public land and break them up. So before, like, a large chunk of public land would be given to a rich person and they would administrate it. And now what he wants to have happen is instead of one rich person uh, administrating it, he wants to break it up and give it to regular people, veterans from wars, uh, Roman citizens, that sort of thing. And that will help not only those people have some land and a way to make a living, it'll also help the Roman army because now more people meet the land requirement. Um, this is actually just uh, kind of as an interesting side note, it's actually not even that new. There was actually a piece of legislation about 250 years earlier that stated that nobody should kind of have these large chunks of land. All he wants to do is basically go back and start enforcing that. Now this is where things get a little bit weird. So Tiberius Gracchus, instead of taking his piece of legislation to the Senate and running it by them before it goes to a vote, he basically just takes it straight to the people for a vote. And this is where we start to see something kind of strange. So it turns out that the Senate, even though they have an incredible amount of kind of de facto power, right, kind of an incredible amount of influence, they don't have a lot of legal power. So you didn't necessarily have to take all your laws to the Senate for approval before you took them to the people. And Tiberius Gracchus just turns out to be one of the first people who's like, oh, I don't have to do that? Well, the Senate's gonna hate this legislation and the people are gonna love it. Let's just take it straight to the people. And the people do love it, all right? But the Senate does not, and they actually are able to convince the other tribune, there are always two tribunes as well, they're able to convince the other tribune to basically veto the bill. And this is where Tiberius takes another weird step. Instead of saying, okay, well, that didn't work out. He basically says, you better get on board or I'm gonna have you thrown out of office. I'm gonna basically call for a vote and get you impeached from the tribune. And the other tribune doesn't re retract his veto. And so Tiberius Gracchus does exactly that. He calls for a vote from the people and the people who, again, really like this legislation, kick this other tribune out of office. And so therefore, the, uh, the, the legislation passes. The land reform bill passes, and it's actually kind of fairly successful. So Tiberius Gracchus puts together this agrarian commission to do the dividing, and it's made up of him and his younger brother Gaius and one of their other good friends. And the Senate reacts to this by basically giving them no budget to do this, right? So they were legally allowed to because the bill passed, but the Senate all uh, allots them a denarius and a half a day, right? So something like uh, no money at all to actually be able to do this. And what Tiberius does is he says, I want the Pergamene treasury. And so you may remember that in this very same year, the kingdom of Pergamon in Northwestern Turkey has bequeathed itself to the city of Rome. And the, even though they were fairly small, they were an incredibly rich little kingdom. And so what Tiberius wants is he wants to use the money from Pergamon to be able to fund the land reform. Wanting to take this kind of treasury for his own use in doing this, uh, it starts a series of rumors. And those rumors are saying that Tiberius has his eyes on more than just kind of being tribute and redistributing the land. He has eyes on becoming a tyrant, becoming sole leader of Rome. Now, what uh, Tiberius does, and again, this is unusual but not unheard of, is he decides to run for a second year of tribune. So normally they would just rule for one year and then you'd be out of office. He decides to run for a second year. And just like kind of not running things by the Senate, it's unusual but not illegal. Now, 
Uh, they're calling for all these bad omens during the election, right? So the priests, the Senate has influenced the priests. They're saying, we can't have the election because of these bad omens. People are blocking the doors to the Senate house. All things, these things are kind of going wrong on election day. And what ends up happening is that at some point in time, these kind of rival factions start jarring with each other, right? Start pushing each other. And uh, it ends up breaking out, and this kind of angry senatorial mob, along with all their supporters, uh, ends up breaking up these benches, these wooden benches and chairs. And they end up beating Tiberius Gracchus to death, along with 300 of his followers. And this is crazy, because the, the tribune is supposed to be sacrosanct. Nobody should lay a finger on a tribune ever. And there was nothing past declaring him an enemy of the state, and so this was kind of completely illegal. But Tiberius and 300 of his followers are beaten to death with wooden benches, and then they're thrown into the Tiber River. What do we make of this guy, right? Like, what do you make of Tiberius Gracchus? On the one hand, the guy's fighting for the people, right? He wants to redistribute land and give it to regular people in Rome. On the other hand, uh, he's kind of tyrannical in some ways, right? He gets the other tribune kicked out of office. He doesn't run the, the legislation by the Senate. He's ready to run for a second term of this office, which is also unusual. And so think about some of those kind of questions as you, you ponder um, how he fits in uh, to Rome and how he should be remembered. Ten years later, his younger brother, Gaius Gracchus, is able to take over that same position of tribune of the plebs. Now what's kind of crazy is even after the death of Tiberius Gracchus, right, you'd think the Senate would just get rid of all that stuff, the land reform bill actually goes forward, right? They actually keep the legislation, and it's like fairly effective. So something like 75,000 people get new plots of land, and something like 20,000 people are added to the army because of these new plots of land. And so kind of crazily, like the land bill, it works. Um, now, Gaius Gracchus wants to do much of the same stuff as his brother, uh, you can think of Gaius Gracchus as Tiberius, but on steroids, all right? He wants to do all this land reform stuff and much, much more. <clears throat> so one of the things that he does is he invests a ton in infrastructure, all right? So he's a road builder. He's building kind of and refurbishing all these roads. Something like the Via Appia has been around for nearly 200 years now in a desperate need of kind of renovation. Uh, so this is helping the economy, and it's also helping... Uh, bring people from the countryside, from all these new farms that he's just settled. It's helping them bring them in to the city of Rome. And why is that important? Why is it important that these farmers can get to the city of Rome? Well, it's important because then they can vote, right? And who do you think they're going to vote for? They're going to vote for the guy who gave them a piece of land, who built a road so that they can get to the city of Rome and go trade at the markets. And so while this is kind of uh, on the surface, it's really to help people, right? Help regular people. You could also interpret it as a way uh, to kind of bolster your own position by getting political support. In addition, he starts this kind of grain subsidy, right? So he passes a law that we should set the price of grain. Rome's going to set the price of grain. Now, it's not crazy low, but it's kind of like an average price. And so when times when grain is plentiful, it's actually a little bit more than it would be in a free market. And in times when grain is scarce, it's actually a lot less than it would be in a free market. But this basically stabilizes the price, so you don't have to worry as much about these kind of wild fluctuations. And once again, you think about who this would benefit the most, it's those poor segments of the population that wouldn't necessarily be able to afford it. So he starts these kind of series of military reforms as well. We've got all these new people in the army, they're not necessarily very rich, right? They might have just gotten their piece of land. And he says that no longer should you have to provide your own weapons and armor. The, the kind of government itself should equip you with those things once you join. And so this, again, is able to uh, kind of bolster Roman power by admitting more people who wouldn't necessarily have been able to afford being in the army previously. And again, it's also able to make a bunch of people happy with him uh, from those lower rungs of society. He's also got this kind of vision imperially, right? Kind of empire-wide about founding colonies. So it's, it's Gaius Gracchus who's the first guy, right? This is only 13 years after the end of the Third Punic War. He's the first guy who wants to go ahead 
and found a colony on the site of Carthage. He wants to call it Junonia. And he actually starts construction there uh, kind of before the Senate tries to sh uh, shut it down. He also founds a couple other colonies over Greek city-states in southern Italy. Politically and judicially, he starts implementing this legislation to limit the impact of the Senate on juries. And so what would end up happening is that if a senator or like a governor of a province was put on trial for extorting his population, right? This happened very frequently. If you're a governor in a province, you're going to try to collect way too much, more than you deserve in taxes. And then sometimes, right, they can put you on trial for that. But what would happen is when you're on trial, all your buddies are just senators and they'd just let you go. They'd let you off the hook. And, um, and so what Gaius Gracchus does is says, you can't just have a jury of a bunch of senators letting uh, their buddies off. And so he reforms this kind of um, problem of extortion and who can serve on the jury. And then he starts thinking really crazily. So one of the problems is that the allies, right, all over the Italian peninsula are starting to say that like, you know, I guess we get a couple benefits but we should really have the same rights and privileges as the people in Rome. And Gaius Gracchus says, absolutely you should, right? He wants to give all those Italian and Roman allies, he wants to give them Roman citizenship. And once again, you could imagine what the impact would be. On the one hand, hey, citizenship for everybody. This is like a really like kind of noble idea. On the other hand, you could think of this from a different perspective where it's like, okay, he's doing this so that he can have more power himself. So the senators are opposed, um, and using this kind of thing, they brand him a demagogue, right? Just like his older brother, they're saying, you're becoming like a tyrant, trying to play uh, on the power of the people to get what you want and basically take over the city. All right, now, what Tiberius has to do is he has to run for a third term as tribune. He's been tribune twice already, but he knows having been branded a demagogue by the Senate, that things are not looking good for him. He's got to maintain this office so he can maintain that kind of position of being sacrosanct where nobody can touch him. They can't throw him in jail. They can't physically harm him. But in that third election, he's defeated. And one of the first things his opponent, the new uh, kind of consul does, um, is he passes something known as the Senatus Consultum Ultimum, the SCU. And that declares Gaius Gracchus an enemy of the state. And what that means is that any person in Rome, any citizen of Rome, is bound to do him harm. No more trials, nothing like that. If you see the guy, you kill the guy. And Gaius Gracchus knows that this is not looking good for him. He retreats with one of his slaves to the Aventine Hill, the Hill of Remus, the Hill of the People in Rome. And there he has his uh, slave kill him, um, essentially kind of committing a version of suicide. So. A couple concluding thoughts here. What are we to make of these guys? When we look at what the ancient Romans thought of them, in generations following the Gracchi, they looked back on these guys as heroes, right? They fought for things for the regular people of Rome. They fought for land reform. They fought for grain subsidies. They fought for infrastructure and citizenship. But you can look at it from another perspective. You could think of the Gracchi as the first people to really realize not the power of the people, but the kind of how much power they could get by playing to the people, right? The power in the people, kind of by using them and giving them things they wanted. These tribunes, right, who tend to be fairly low on the political ladder, ended up gaining more power than the consuls themselves. And so are these guys reformers, right? Um, or are they just in this for the prestige and glory that comes along with kind of being the most powerful person in the city of Rome. The final thing we can take away here is that we're starting to get these kind of inklings of violence, right? We're not to all out civil war, but we see uh, Tiberius Gracchus beaten to death with benches. We see Gaius having to commit suicide on top of the Aventine Hill. And what we'll end up seeing is how these kind of isolated incidents of violence end up exploding into full blown civil warfare. But that happens long after the Gracchi, Rise of the Populares.